for a meeting and he said, what do you want me to rant about? And I said, yes. So <laughs> without further ado, and I'm already looking at the people who are going to kill him later, uh, take it away and Commander. Please give him a round of applause. Woo! So just to explain on that a little bit, uh, I often am the person that fills in when we have gaps, which means that end commander rants have been the staple for about two years. <laughs> Normally, I don't have time to plan these, and this one actually was no exception because my life was really busy this week. So, you, um, I have been running on about five minutes of sleep in the last three days. Woohoo! So basically, I'm back at hope. Woo! Um, part of these talks are slided. Some of them are going to be freeform. And there is going to be a section that we are going to do off camera because I do not wish for it to be recorded. And a quiz at the end. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> We're going to go until I either faint and killed or they throw us out, whichever comes first. Or all three. So, who am I? I am end commander. I've been working in tech for about, oh dear God, uh, 15 years now. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> I was an employee from Canonical at 2009 to 2015, working on YouTube. And then I worked in video streaming and kind of crap. I'm currently a volunteer at uh, the ICANN organization and am doing research into DNS security on the internet. I also come up with the most evil and, well, you know, just the most evil ideas of the mankind that make security readers cry. Uh, True. I, have, I have a 40 pound piece of hardware that we roll out to conferences to prove this point. That same place. Hardware also blew up Hotel Pennsylvania. And we will be showing that at a future meeting next year. So. It will actually be <laughs> talked about in this talk. Because yeah. <laughs> so, let's get some words of warning. This talk is not appropriate for all audiences. If you think everything is right in the world, there's the exit. If you think everything is wrong in the world, also the exit. If you need a blood alcohol of 0 0.08 or higher to get for your work day, uh, please talk to your doctor before listening to this talk. <laughs> oh. Actually, if you think peak stupidity uh, re happened around the turn of the century, I am about to burst your bubble. Thank you. So, the nice first one we're going to talk about is... Me! Uh, would you like to take over? Uh, it's my phone. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, you're the beard later. Oh, come on. <laughs> Google Slides you. can suck me, but, <laughs> but you know what? It's still better than Libre Offers Presents. Present. So that's how they get your data. <laughs> if I wasn't wearing, if I could take my shoes off, I would be you right in the head right now. <laughs> Have a can of seltzer. <laughs> so, and Commander rants about clouds. And you know what? Clouds suck. They make flight delay. Oh, wait, no, wrong cloud. Sorry. The fact of the matter is. Cloud computing has been this buzzword that refuses to die in this industry. We find so many managers that think moving servers to the cloud is a good idea. It is the responsibility of everyone in this room to get a big stick <coughs> and hit the people responsible for this idea. The reason for this is that when you have your data in the cloud, it is not just your data. It is Amazon or Linode's or someone else's data. It is the data of the federal government because you know what? It is easy to image a cloud server with a warrant. So this is uh, step one. Now for some people, that's not a big deal. If you're running a small business that sells, I don't know, comic books. If the NSA has the data, I don't think it's the end of the world. If you're a medical organization, Check with your lawyers for goddamn it. I am tired of having to explain to IT people that HIPAA is not a suggestion. <laughs> I may be having flashbacks to a previous conference. So this is the beginning, by the way. Is it yes, this is the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> this goes steadily downhill as the night goes on, and I have not drank all day because I need to be sober enough to come up with these. Topics. I'm the one CPR trained, so yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I am still an EMT and I'm a firefighter. I, I can see pure myself. I'm determined enough. Well, we and have the cameras. So. so let's <laughs> talk about the age-old days of when Neo was, you know, just a young boy, and how net and how networking used to work. Wait, uh, Triassic Sneakernet. or Jurassic? Uh, <laughs> Precambrian. Centrassic. You know, we we are talking about Tokyo. Right? Yeah. That's your center ass, all right. <laughs> So back in the grand old days of, I don't know, mid, mid to the early 80s to very early 90s, 
there was the person. There were three types of computers in the world. You had mainframes, you had mini computers, and you had microcomputers. Mainframes, as the name suggests, lots of power, lots of power usage, and a bill that would make most uh, most small firms cry. Mini computers were similar to early VAC systems and essentially ran a Unix, OpenVMS, TOPS 10, something of that nature. You know, it was meant for actual work at multiple users. You might have a whole one megabyte of RAM on one. Wow. And, yeah. At the very end of the scale were microcomputers. These uh, range from the high end, as such as the PC uh, 5150, which was the first PC compatible by IBM, with a whopping 32 kilobytes of RAM in its default configuration, running DOS 1.0 to your Apple IIe's GS, uh, to your Commodore 64's. So the main difference in microcomputers was how you determined, you know, I'm getting off topic, I'm skip ahead of it. So back, um, say, mid 80's, network technology started advancing to the point that it could be installed in pretty much any computer known to mankind. Now, the thing is that it's not that hard to build a network. It's hard to build a good one, but you know we're dealing with amateurs here. IT, IT professionals are were no more respected then than they are now. Exactly. But you know, an office could have one printer plugged into a computer, and you could access it through Novell Net Sharing, Apple Talk Chooser. Uh, if you're really desperate, Microsoft uh, SMB, or if you're really really desperate, or yeah, uh, LPR. Um, sorry, Jack. <laughs> but the concept was you had everything in your office. You knew who had your data, and you didn't have to go to be crazy. Now, in this current day, the day and age, there are things called Google Cloud Print because your printer needs to be on the cloud to work. And this is actually a product that Google hasn't killed yet. Don't, don't, we'll, we'll follow up on this next year. But the idea is that if it's in your office, you can control it, you understand it. You might have one large system in a rack that has most of your data backed up to you. Oh, good to see Someone else who I can stroke out before this night's over. Uh, anyway, all your data, one rack. You control your network, you control your stack, and you control your firewall. You know, data stayed where it was supposed to be. Now we have to talk of moving everything to the cloud. You have Google Docs, all your information is now part of Google. Hope you paid your Google App subscription. What's your backup plan? The simple fact of the matter is people move things to the cloud and think it's magic. And I see this in IT fields a lot. What is your plan if you want to migrate out of the cloud? What is your plan if you want to move your stuff from Google Apps? Because let's be honest, Google is not the same company as it was five years ago. I, I don't know when to mark when Google went from don't be evil to, ha ha, we are evil. We're going to have a Bond Island. <laughs> Alphabet. Yeah, somewhere. At in least there. when Google cancels Google Island, it might actually sink. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like one of those bad Disney theme parks. I mean, well, let's put it like this. Don't give you, them ideas. You, you have better, you have, you have better chances in Vegas than a Google product lasting more than two years. Ooh. Am I wrong? Nope. So. The long story is short of it is if you are going to use the cloud, know what you're using it for. Internet facing services are an excellent candidate for the cloud, but know what information you're storing. Make sure that your legal compliances meet because God almighty, PCI is not a suggestion. HIPAA is not a suggestion. Data security is important. And if I have to meet one more business that says, oh, HIPAA doesn't really matter, I am going to beat them with a shoe. You may guess what my last contract dealt with. <laughs> anyway, the long and short of it is cloud computing, like anything else, is a resource. Unlike some things like, you know, say blockchain, it is actually Ooh. useful. Um, but the fact of the matter is if you can keep your information in your own site, do so. It's not that hard to build a simple U1 rack server or clip on hardware. What, you know, uh, a low end Xeon, less about a thousand bucks with redundant drive and backup? Yeah. 1500. 1500. Compared to cloud computing costs, you'll pay that off in about two years. And given we have more or less maxed out on 
CPU usage, and most cloud youth servers are, shall we say, anemic, you're going to get a lot more better money on that investment than not, and you're going to probably pay less in IT fees and other issues. The only oil issue you run into is trying to get IP space, which is an entirely separate topic for that rant, so I'm going to say it for now. So, in short, the cloud sucks, the cloud rains, the cloud goes down, and there's jack shit you can do about it. It's like trying to, it's like trying to route baggage from Philadelphia. It's just not oh. going to happen. So, before I get off this topic, does anyone want to throw any suggestions my way to so I can rant with those two? Going once. Going twice. Security key. Sold. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. I have mentally blocked it. Okay. You know what? This, I'm going to specifically that sounds like on Amazon for this because Amazon makes this more obnoxious than it has to be. Amazon used to have a very simple way of renting a cloud server called EC2. Then Amazon EC2 became Amazon Web Services. Amazon decided that, oh, but you might also want to have DynamoDB or Simple SQL or, you know, uh, on that service that sends you a text message from your manager flushes the toilet. Who knows? The simple, the fact of the matter is they decided to do this in an all unified and are called Identification Access Management or IAM. Everything that you do in the Amazon cloud is controlled by IAM. Is an undocumented disaster of a mess. All Amazon products use it, so when you open the GUI, and I sadly don't have a screenshot, because this is this is how not to design a user interface. It is a set. Anyone here you uh, use OS2 and remember the list of options of configuring a DOS app? I keep trying to forget them. <laughs> yes. That is what the uh, AIM thing is, except it's lab. Instead of being a local interface, it's an Ajax loaded web page that is 3 megabytes in size. And you're in China, you're on a VPN, and you're dropping six, uh, four, five out of six check, uh, packets. Yes, this is speaking from personal experience because I lived in Shanghai. So, you know, this is really therapeutic, I gotta tell you. Um, so, the long and short of it is that by making your access keys more complicated than they have to be, to convince your users, or in this case, your system administrators, to do everything in their power to make them insecure by writing down, by putting them in unsecured files saying password here, and you know, making it really easy for any uh, attacker to basically uh, get all your keys and ruin your world. This is stuff I have seen. I'm pretty sure most of you that work in IT or InfoSec, do I need to move on to the next topic? No, just finish that one. That I want to get to the triggering stuff. <laughs> You really want to see me die, don't yes. you? Yes. Finish up. Okay, we'll go to the next topic. The long story short, if you're going to use the cloud, don't be an idiot. If you're going to use password man uh, uh, credential management, know what you're doing. Don't make security a hassle. We are going to talk about passwordless management as a future rant. So that's stay that tuned. Long. Here we go. So it's not that one. So. No, it's the uh, third or fourth one. I know. So the next one we're going to talk about is how the IETF shot themselves in the effing foot and how we could have had IPv6 in the early 90s. So let's talk with a very simple basic fact. The internet is full. There is no way, uh, there's no denying this fact. The IPv4, the protocol that currently binds the internet, is a 32-bit integer address that is assigned to every computer. There are approximately 7 billion people um, on the planet, and probably about anywhere between 11 and 12 billion internet-enabled devices at any given time. That does not fit in a 32-bit integer. In a clear moment of, in, when the internet was designed as part of ARPANET in the 1980s, this was not a foreseeable problem because no one saw the you know, everyone's gonna have a goddamn smartphone in their pocket. And a but printer that needs to talk to the cloud. Yes, that too. Um, so, basically, it became clear in the early 90s, about 90, 91, that technology needs to move on. And I will note that this slide deck is incomplete, but I will do the rest of the ranch of memory. So, before this rant actually goes off, I'm going to show a picture of IP class allocations from ARPANET, 
and I want someone in this room to identify what is on that picture that doesn't seem right. Oh, my eyes. Oh, man. <laughs> Waiting for an answer. Anybody? Oh. I'll do it as a quiz. Uh. <laughs> Going once. Going twice. Wait, what? Sarah's what? What? Uh, I, I see one big one. Oh, a little bit that works. Yes. Yeah. 10.0.0.8 was not always private IP space. In fact, oh. it was the first network that went up on ARPANET. That was the U.S. Department of Defense. Oh. It's right there in the center. ARPA 10. And then oh. the IP address. Those oh. Ten, the 10 networks, uh, the 10 dot IP address, those used to be public. Private IP space. Oh, 82. Fail one, RF 1918. This was, so for those that are not familiar with the Internet Engineering Task Force. Plot twist, the US government still uses the business plan. The other one is like, that's not yours. Oh, God. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Poor shot. <laughs> but before, RFCs are essentially internet doc are documents published by the IETF that define internet standards. They also uniquely can reserve blocks of IPs for specific usage. And, believe it or not, RFC 1918 did not exist until 1995. 10.8 was returned to the pool when ARPANET was decommissioned and was unassigned. Reminder, the internet had existed for 15 years. Neil remembers, he's that old. I was there for the party. <laughs> so. The internet itself is built on a very simple concept. Device A can talk to device B. Device B can talk to device C. Device C can talk to device A. This is called end-to-end -end routing. And it's done by the fact that every device on the internet is supposed to have a publicly accessible IP address. Now, obviously, this is no longer true. But everything assumes it's true. And a whole bunch of hacks hold the thing together. That's, that's the next slide. So. The fact of the matter is that the IETF decided that certain now, originally if you wanted to deploy IPv4 on your internal network, even if it was not connected to the internet, you were supposed to get an allocation from Arwen. And this was before CIDR class, uh, classes networks. So you either got a class C, which in modern terms is a slash 24, a class B, which is a slash 16, or a class A, which is a slash 8. This is incidentally how HP manages to own one, uh, one 255th of all HP, uh, all internet spaces, because they bought DAC. Or no, digital. So, uh, RFC 1918 was to solve this problem by making it possible to deploy IPv4 in the office, in your workstation, without having to deal with any bullshit. You just select addresses from this range, and you won't have a collision. Then someone came up with NAT. So, actually this is the next slide. I'm, <laughs> I'm ranting ahead of my slide deck. So before we used to use IP, believe it or not, IPv, IP was actually very rare on corporate networks. Normally, when you built out an, uh, that, built out um, an office network, you normally used, if it was an Apple-based office, you were using Apple Talk. If you were smart, you were using Novell Netware. If you were cheap, you're using Microsoft SMB server or Windows NT. If you were anal, you're still using DECnet. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about DECnet. We'll <laughs> save it for another day. Yeah, well, any, sorry, DECnet, any protocol that requires you to change your MAC address just to make it work has fundamental flaws with it. <laughs> but that's a completely different rant. The main advantages of IPX Net, NetBIOS and Apple Talk was they were plug and play network technologies. You didn't have to design your network for better or worse. You plugged it in, the device could see it from the chairs, you typed in a name, and it magically all worked. Now, you may think, wait, doesn't IPv4 work like that? It does now, but it did at the time. Uh, all right, you know, let's, let, before we get to that, hold that thought. For, I'm, I'm ranting out of order because it's all in my head and I haven't practiced these slides as much as I should have. Anyway. He's been up for three days with five minutes rest. What he said. Anyway, the reason why this was a fail. 
IPv6 was designed to keep end-to-end -end routability on the internet. This is a good thing. This is why we don't need hacks like STUN. It's why IPv6 would work reliably. It's why we don't need five different bastardizations of FTP, including passive FTP. It would let things like IPsec work, which is another thing on this list. The, by creating RFC 1918 space, the, I, the, li the life of IPv4 went from approximately two to three years to 20 plus, because the need for IP addresses went down. Now, it didn't stop that need, but now we're at the point that we have 10 to 12 billion addresses on the internet, and they all need to be moved to IPv6. Thanks a lot, guys. You know, IPv6 solved this problem because there was a lot more address space to go around. There are, there's enough address space in IPv6 that we can give each individual atom on the goddamn planet an IP address and they have enough left over. Such a large number, I can't even pronounce it. That's what she said. <laughs> Moving right this. along. So, oh, and just as an added bonus, just in case you want to have a completely disconnected network from the internet, universally local addresses avoid all the bullshit of when you have to bridge a VPN to a, v, uh, to a corporate network and you have an IP collision. Who has dealt with that particular nightmare? Really? Oh, okay. No, there's people with their hands up. <laughs> so, They're hanging their heads in shame. Yes, hanging. or, uh, I'm or sure face palming. The whiskey bottle and start going around. <laughs> so, long, short, long story short, the IETF cut off the first killer feature of IPv6 right out of the gate. The next hit, fail, DHCP. Oh, God. Believe it or not, this is a fail. Here's a little known fact about DHCP. It is a modern invention. It was standardized in 1997. Now, there are people in this room that were probably not even born in 1997, and the internet at this point was now 25 years old. 27. Yes. Technical. I was there for the party. So, DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Client Protocol. It is basically a way to plug your laptop in the network and make it just work. It wasn't the first type of protocol. The P2P, uh, PPP for dial-up networks had a de facto implementation of this. For more esoteric uses, we had boot key and reverse ARC, uh, protocols that thankfully burned in hell. Um, but not fast enough. Well, we're going to have a demonstration of why they died. So IPv6 was going to provide stateless auto configuration. It was going to be, oh, actually, you know what, we need a demo. I need three volunteers. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Either volunteer or be victimized. Okay. So I'm going to explain how auto configuration worked. First, this is reverse ARC. Congratulations, your IP address is 10.00.1. Have a good day. Next, we have. Who's next? Next, we have Boot Key. Your address is 10.00.2. Your next gateway is over here. And then we have DHCP. This is my third victim. Take this one. Okay. Your IP address is 10.00.3. Your gateway is 10.00.25. The coffee machine is over there. Your Win server is over there. The TFTP server is over there. Have a nice day. Oh, and your lease is also needs to be renewed in about 24 hours. Uh, needless to say, it gave a lot of freaking information. It basically made uh, plug and play networks, it made Wi Fi. Via, uh, viable, it made home networking viable because you didn't need to be a freaking network engineer to deploy it. There's just one problem with this. IPv6 <laughs> was supposed to deploy this. Uh, in IPv6 we have stateless auto configuration. The concept is that when you plug a device into a network that is IPv6 enabled, uh, the net network would net broadcast what's called a router advertisement your machine would get an IP address that would be static for the full lifetime of its uh, on its network. Happy holiday, it would get the next network, network and it would, get the D, it would get the DNS servers. This was plug and play. This is more plug and play than DHCP is because you can set up Slack with, and this don't this has nothing to do with the chat room. I'll just make this clear. I'll just let you know that this shows you how Slack has disappointed two separate generations. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even consider that, but it is completely true. 
<laughs> now I need a drink. <laughs> Jack, you know so, what you <laughs> the fact of the matter is that while Slack has a couple of issues with it, it predated DHCP, and the fact of the matter is it works better than DHCP because your network doesn't self-destruct if the router goes down for three seconds. And then we're going to get mini fail, oh, Pixie. God. Now, I could talk a lot about netboot fails, but there is one thing DHCP did provide that Slack did not. It provided the ability to do what's a true plug and play, diskless system with no hard drive, out of the box. Pixie, or which stands for Preboot Executable Environment, was designed by Intel to try and compete with Novell Netware for Microsoft. This is a specification that should be read just for how bad it is. Uh, it is remar it's remarkably bad specification. Um, while the standards exist, to this day, while all the necessary standards exist and have been updated, to this day, I have yet to find a client that can pixie boot on a pure IPv6 network. Now, if anyone can show me a working example of this, I will give you five bucks. Autographed? Yes, I'll even autograph it. I got you. Don Knuth, eat your heart out. Mozilla and Slacks. Sorry, say that again? Mozilla and Slacks Linux. On a pure IPv6 network with no before connection. Right. That would include Portage. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that would include Portage. That was a $1 try. <laughs> I should have charged much better. That's why I know. I have to get this out of my system because I deal a lot with network booting. On a later topic in this slide, we are going to see actual bug reports from when I worked at Canonical. And let's there. just say quite a few of them involve this topic. And if I remember correctly, that's not when we turn the cameras off either. So no, it isn't. No, the one yeah. that's going to turn the cameras off, I am going to get vicious on the topic involved. Uh -huh. I'll let you know about the timing, yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, OK. So I didn't finish all the slides for this <laughs> because, again, not enough sleep. So other great things from IPv6. Let's call this fail free. IPsec. Oh. Who knows what IPsec is? Okay. So, in the mid 90s, there was this idea that encryption might be a good thing. It might even be better if. if, if uh oh. If the internet protocol itself was encrypted, so we wouldn't need stuff like HTTPS or a or, uh, secure shell. Instead, Telnet and standard HTTP would automatically be encrypted and automatically be signed. The original version of the IPv6 specification defined IPsec. It was essentially a bolted on level encryption that encrypted everything and was mandated for deployment. Killed, while well, I can't prove this, by the US government. Uh, IPvSec was dro silently dropped from mandatory to optional and then it made a killer mistake in the era of NAT. It requires an IP protocol number. For those who are not aware, TCP IP is not the only potential thing you can run over an IP network. Now some of you might say UDP, but in fact, there are 255 bytes that define protocol traffic for IP. Some of them you may have heard of, like SCTP, and some you really wish you never heard of, like NTP. <laughs> the, long, the long story short, though, is that for IPsec to work, you needed end-to-end -end routability, and you needed a software stack that was not complete chipped, that is not strong swam. Uh, so um, IPsec was dropped to optional. It was ported to IPv4, although I don't consider this an actual um, negation of IPv6. I'm just saying that the people involved really should have designed their protocol slightly better. Now, one good thing that actually came about the IPsec disaster is that the IETF learned that internet middle boxes exist and people do not update their firmware. So about this time is when the IETF started making backwards compatible changes to the network, uh, to protocols. TLS 1.2 being, an, uh, sorry, 1.3 being an example of this. So, the lesson learned here, we could have had everything encrypted um, from the get-go and shut down the NSA surveillance wiretapping in the 90s. But we can't have nice things. Yeah, uh, whiskey is going around for people that need to drink. 
because uh, I'm pretty sure the next topic is going to cause drinking. <laughs> Let's see here. So that was IP sec. Um, fail number five. Multicast. Oh God. <laughs> So let's Does that talk include MDNS? No, because that was made by Apple, and Apple t kills every standard they touch. Well, the majority of you do. Keep let's drinking. Go, okay. Apple, Apple is to standards as Oracle is to customer service. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. I said it. Uh, it's on film. Put it on YouTube. <laughs> oh, it's going to go a lot of places. Uh, this is. What you're actually watching is the death of my career, one second at a time. But I stand by that previous statement regardless. Multicast. Way, so yeah. Okay, so I need to move a little faster. Mm -hmm. the, the next one's likely going to get me killed, and then if I survive that, we're going to do one more rant, we're going to break for the private one, and then I'm just going to free ball the rest of them. Okay, you should have time, because it's we, we're, we close at 10, so just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, we, I, we I just do want to get the rant. private one out, and the private one's pretty long. Gotcha. So, anyway. Broadcasting. IPv6 adoption was shot in the foot because all its killer features got backported to IPv4. Oh, no, wait, I was talking about multicast. I'm sorry, I wasn't subscribed to the right group. Oh. <laughs> what multicast is, the concept is send one packet, go to multiple machines at once. Um, the idea was not new. It was actually defined in IPv4 as class D networking space. That is, IP addresses 22... Uh, 224 uh, to 239, I believe. Yeah, 239. Multicast, uh, IPv6 requires multicast. There is no concept of a broadcast address in IPv6. This was allow, designed to allow to IP, uh, IPTV streaming, to allow something like Netflix not to use uh, one third of the internet bandwidth, because you can use multicast to stream things to multiple points on the internet. Now this is possible under IPv4, but because IPv4 was designed in the 80s when talking to one computer was a novelty, it doesn't support it particularly well, and it needs help for daemons, specifically IGMP to make it work. In IPv6, multicast works, and it works well. Uh, sometimes you have issues getting it to cross routers, but if we were all on the same Wi-Fi, I could make multicast work with every computer in this room without issue. And thus, I could stream firmware updates, uh, media, anything I want, one connection, and not uh, and not using multiple amounts of bandwidth. Sadly, multicast as a technical specification has died for one reason: Wi-Fi. The reason for this is that Wi-Fi sucks for multicast because you're using the bandwidth multiple times, regardless of how many people are subscribed to the group. It is there has been work? by the uh, IEEE to try and make this suck less by like putting Matt to cast onto the Wi-Fi channel, but there simply is not enough radio spectrum to make it work. So the odds are that multicast will die a slow, silent death and be throttled in the crib, except in limited deployment use cases. The lessons you should take away from this. If you want people to take your new product, don't backward all your killer features to your old product. There are lots of marketing departments that could learn this. The IETF had learned this the hard way. The fact of the matter is in this day and age, the only major feature of IPv6 is its 128-bit address space. As it's been proven, people will not upgrade to IPv6 even if you put a ton of porn on it. What about a bunch of emojis? We can get emoji domains on IPv6. So you're saying Chelsea Manning's on IPv6? You can get emoji, uh, emoji <laughs> domains on DNS on IPv4. Yes, but we don't actually pretend those exist. Can we stream the emoji movie on it? You didn't see the one with like seven movies on it.